What it is, everyone. We're back with another top five exclusive right here at MacGuffinPodcast.com. I'm Alan. I'm Brandy. And today on Top 5, we will be talking about our Top 5 directorial debuts. Every journey starts with one step. <laughs> for these directors, they made the biggest impressions with their first films. Yeah, we're talking, you know, to get a little bit into the rules here, feature length, direct theatrical debuts. Right, we're not so talking like, about TV. We're a lot of people had films. a lot of short films, you yeah. know, that you start out a little bit. So this was a tough one for me because it's it was surprising to me when I started thinking about it, the number of directors whose first full lengths were really just like, bam, oh, great yeah. representations of an yeah. awesome career. So um, I'll be curious to see what you have on your list too. Right. So let's uh, start it off uh, with my number five. Um, my number five feature length debut was from 1984 and it was Rob Reina with This Is Spinal Tap. Oh, I thought about this one. Yes, I'm glad you have this one here. You have that mockumentary about this aging rock band, completely completely dysfunctional, and you have Rob Reiner playing, I guess, another version of himself, just kind of capturing (laughs) all the zaniness that these guys are going through. Spinal Tap is so good. And I mean, (laughs) Spinal Tap is just, it's one of those great great like pseudo films uh everything from that and then you move on to all the way to like for your consideration and films and it goes on and on yeah um and that movie just made such an impression it's so funny um i mean you have the tombstone or the the stone and then you have like going to 11 and everything like that uh just the beginning (laughs) of a great early career for rob reiner yeah he Um, had a great streak in the 80s and man rob reiner come on man you know you have another one in you bring it back bring it back okay (laughs) So, All right, yeah. good pick. Okay, my number five. Actually, um, this is a pretty recent film, and it's the only film that this director has made so far. I'm almost desperate for him to make another one, but I don't know if he's going to. And that is a single man directed by Tom Ford, who mm. is primarily a fashion designer. Yeah. And uh, I, this movie annihilated me. Like uh, this is what Colin Firth was nominated for the year before he won for the King's Speech. I think he should have won for this one. Um mm. I'm glad he has an Oscar of any sort, but comparing even comparing the two performances, I'm just like Colin Firth will break your fucking heart in this one. Uh a, a story of a gay man living in the 60s whose a longtime partner is killed in a car accident yeah. and the pressures that he faces afterwards when you know he managed to carve out this niche of a life that he was comfortable in in a society that doesn't really let him be out and and comfortable and once that safety net is taken away it's just a a pretty harrowing drop Mm. and tom ford obviously has a great eye for Vision, visuals like most yeah. designers do and is absolutely gorgeous as well besides yeah. the performances from uh from Colin Firth and from Julianne Moore as his best friend yeah I think I'm gonna have to revisit <clears throat> that film um I did admire it on a technical level I thought it was beautifully made I thought the acting was very good I kind of couldn't really get into it because Colin Firth's character was just kind of moping around the entire time, just like, oh, I'm so, my life sucks, I'm gonna kill myself. Pretty much. And the relationship between him and Julianne Moore, it just felt, it felt like just all surface for me. I I just wish there was a little bit more there for me. Mm. Um, But in terms of like technical stuff, it it was very good. I'd like to see more from Tom Ford as well. Okay, moving on to my number four. my number four filmmaker is a director that I thought of immediately when I thought about this, uh, and it is Quentin Tarantino with Reservoir Dogs. Um, not his best film. I, w- I wouldn't say yeah, that it's his the, best I film. I thought about this one, but I ultimately didn't put it on because there are just so many Tarantino films I love so much mm-hmm. more than Reservoir Dogs. The reason why I did put it on was <clears> because <throat> I couldn't deny the fact that this film made such an impression on uh, on me. Um, the style from the very beginning of, of his career was so in control. I mean, sure, the film has some problems, but you have everything in that movie that you see in his later career. You have, you know, the the criminals at play as the main characters. You have the dialogue. Um, you have the broken narrative. It's all there, and it just needed a little bit of refinement, I think, to get to where he is now. But everything that was great about Quentin Tarantino now was established in that movie. So, mm, fair enough. Yep. 
Okay, number four. This is a filmmaker who I probably love a lot more than the average person loves her, but I am one of the biggest Miranda July fans you will ever meet, and 2005's Me and You and Everyone We Know, yeah. I think is just like, you know, she had, I mean, it's amazing. And mm -hmm. as a first full-length film, she had short films, she's had a lot of stage work, but as embracing a new kind of storytelling, the full-length mm -hmm. film, so good. I just, I mm -hmm. love this movie so much. I know a lot of people think it's like too quirky, too much, but to me, like, it really speaks to me. The themes speak to me. The dialogue is wonderful, I think, and it, in I also, The Future was one of my favorite films of last year, so I really hope she sticks with this full-length film mm -hmm. path because I think she has amazing talent at it. I actually blind bought <clears throat> that film because it was getting so much praise, and I'm afraid to say I kind of fell into the other category. Mm -hmm. Not because I think it was a bad movie or anything like that, it's just that I wasn't prepared for how unique it really was. Um, I do think I need to re rewatch it before I actually give like give it an another shot like, because critique. sometimes her sensibilities take a while to sort of set in. And when uh, I saw this, I was already you know I'd already was familiar with some of her right uh, vibe. Right. So yeah. and it is a, it is a p particular peculiar vibe. Mm -hmm. So and I am interested in seeing the future as well. So yeah. okay, moving on to my number three. <clears throat> um, my number three directorial debut was pretty much like a one and done for this filmmaker. Um, because he was so much of a rebel. And it was <laughs> Easy Rider, directed by Dennis Hopper. Um, yeah. Film pretty much encapsulated the film community and America in that time, all within this film. You have Dennis Hopper, you have Peter Fonda playing these two, gosh, I, I don't know. I don't know if hippie is the right term, but these two cultural rebels mm -hmm. um, that are making their way cross country uh, to Mardi Gras. They go into these really crazy situations. I think they end up in like a, com a commune. <laughs> they hang out with, in a whorehouse. They just go to like all these different places in the country. They meet a drunk lawyer played incredibly well by Jack Nicholson. Jack Nicholson became a star with that movie. That movie would not work without him. Uh, it was just a, a film all about trying to do something different and not, you know, going by the standards of how the past used to be and just going with the flow. So yeah, and I I think Dennis Hopper kind of couldn't make it happen to bring it together to make another film that was going to be accepted by the public yeah. the way that one was, which is too bad because it is a great film. Yes. Okay. My number three, uh, I saw this film not too long ago for the first time and was just, even though I knew that these are filmmakers who are so phenomenal, I was floored that this was the first thing they had ever done. That is Blood Simple from the Coen Brothers. Ooh. Uh, damn, talk about knowing your aesthetic and knowing your tone right off the bat, getting everything right in that first film. You can see the way that it was built off of for their other dark crime movies that they've had since but i mean that is just an enthralling film with some really violent moments mm -hmm. and uh i freaking loved it i was just kind of like not like i was surprised that they had made a good film but just it's so sophisticated for their first effort it's mm -hmm. Uh, it's great. The, 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 man, the Coen brothers, I mean, what more can you say? Those guys should just be national treasures, you know? The government just be like, yep, you guys are national treasures. So that's <laughs> pretty give much me the it. stamp of treasure. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. All right, let's move on to my number two. Uh, my number two filmmaker is one not many people know of. Uh, we're going to go art house on this Ooh. one. And it is Jean Vigo. And the film is from 1934, La Talanta. Ah. This film, when I watched it, completely knocked me off of my feet. I was so amazed at how well this movie that was made more than 70 years ago was so effective. It's Okay, first off, it's the story of these two people that get married. They go on this barge on the river um, just to travel on their honeymoon. They got married, but they don't really know each other, and the entire story involves them growing to love each other and then when they kind of break apart they finally realize how much they care for one another and it is so emotionally <laughs> just emotionally captivating to me um there's another character in there uh jules he's 
kind of like this rough and tough um, sail sailor, and he provides a lot of the heart and a lot of the uh, comedy uh, in that movie. Um, it's amazing that that film, it's just that film just was magical. It 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 showed me that movies don't have to be about isn't, telling stories. But isn't this John Vigo's like only? It's his only film. In fact, film? in fact, he directed this film knowing he was going to die. He directed <laughs> it on a stretcher, and he put his entire all into that movie. And you can feel that in every frame. Uh, please, people, watch it. Uh, it's available on Criterion. Check it out. It's an amazing movie. Holy um, moly! Okay. Yeah. Well, the the one and done thing seems to be a little bit of a, a theme <laughs> for us. I guess we're real impressed when you could only get it together once. Yeah. Um. So another film we've talked about before. I know you love it too. Oh, Night of the it. Hunter. That's my number one. Okay. <laughs> my Charles number Lawton, one. Uh, yeah. distinguished acting career that spanned mm -hmm. decades, but this was the only film that he ever made, and yeah. uh, because it got such a poor reception at the time, he was just kind of like, "Well, I'm done with that." You know, he was a cranky old guy. Mm -hmm. uh, but a s visually so stunning. Yeah. You know, I've 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 read a lot of breakdowns of kind of the different shots in this film and the way that they they played with the angles the and angles, how everything the looks darkness, fake but real at the same time. It was um, amazing. The way he makes Lillian Gish look menacing. You know. <laughs> um, a oh, really amazing movie, and the fact that this was the only movie Charles Lott never made is depressing to me. It's depressing because he just think of how his career would have gone if he just kept going, and they accepted that film, which is way ahead of its time. Oh yeah, um, yeah. people are still stealing shots from that movie. <laughs> oh yeah, Robert Mitchum with the love hate tattoos. You can yep. see that in films and TV today. Yep. And Shelley Winters is amazing. Lillian Gish is great. Those two kids are very very good. Also, it's a incredible haunting movie it's it's so good seriously it's i so mean good. if you've never seen it because it's it is sounding kind of weird um the criterion edition is great mm -hmm. like get it give it a chance it's it's at its core it's basically a crime movie you know and then these it, kids are trying to get away from this criminal who's trying to find the money on their estate right. and but it's about so much more. It's about oh, nightmares. It has you know? everything, everything you want in a movie: horror, <laughs> uh, drama, rom romanticism. Yeah. It's it's everything you want in a movie. All right. So, well, so that was my number. That one. was your number one. Okay. So moving on to my number one, another one that's kind of about another black and white movie that's about nightmares, basically. You know um, how we roll. But it's not a one and done. All right. Uh, David Lynch, Eraserhead. Uh, uh, I just had to put this one at number one because I feel like. People are just sort of like, oh, Eraserhead, that's kind of a weird movie. You don't really understand what happens in it. And I'm like, you need to watch Eraserhead again. It's <laughs> so good. Yeah. And it's like such an amazing movie about fear of having responsibilities in a real life. And I know that David Lynch sort of refuses to speak too much about the interpretation of it. But that that's what it says to me. And he's such a bizarre but a fascinating guy and he came and had this fully formed incredibly surreal aesthetic going from moment one mm -hmm. of, of and i mean this is basically like a student film i mean that's crazy to me i just it's amazing because david lynch he throws so many things into his movies and they are twisted and bizarre but somehow it all kind of works mm -hmm. you know it's like Oh yeah, that what he David Lynch the stuff he does is pretentious. No, not really. I mean, it, it works like on a lower like on a deeper level. It, it connects like it it's great. So David Lynch, you need to make another movie. Yeah, seriously. Yeah. Um, All right. Well, and we'll, we we talked about this before we started recording. We have to acknowledge we are well aware that neither of us put Citizen Kane yes. on the list. I mentioned Citizen Kane like two or three times in other top fives. We it's just like, didn't feel like talking about it today. You can exactly. yell at us and say, you know, oh, you definitely, you have to include Citizen Kane. Don't tell us we forgot it. Yes. We didn't forget we it. We didn't forget <laughs> it. We know. We know. So if you have any directorial <laughs> debuts other than Citizen Kane, let it be known at mcguffinpodcast.com. And we'll see you guys next time. <laughs>